kind of runs in my family. So it's always left me a little bit leery of working with them. However, I do love studying them and everything about the order that they belong to. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about that, the kinds of bees that we have here in Indiana, the food they go after. And then I'm going to hand it to Tabby. And Tabby is a beekeeper and she has a real treat to show you guys later. So I'm going to let her talk about that when we get to her. So starting off, what are our bees? So bees are actually a really, really complex group of animals. They are a part of an order we call Hymenoptera. That's what us entomologists are going to refer to them as. This is an order of insects comprised of all bees, wasps, and ants. And they also include another group called sawflies that are kind of related to bees and ants loosely. Um, they'll look a little bit different, but they will kind of resemble wasps for the most part. One of the biggest things that stands out about this order is their development of social behavior and relationships between members of colonies or members of hives, as I'm sure we are all very familiar with bees forming hives, uh, especially our domesticated European honeybees. And of course, we are all very familiar with the stinging organ that several members of this group has. Many of them do have venom that they can use on us or on anyone else who they consider a threat. So let's dive first into the, the group that you're really here for, our bees. So bees are animals that have a very, very well-established set of social behaviors depending on the species. So not all bees are going to be social. There are some that are solitary. Uh, bees have, some bee species, I should say, have developed organs for carrying pollen. And we also benefit from bees because, of course, we want honey production done in livestock species. Um, bees are generally capable of stinging as a defense. Some of them will die after they sting. Some of them will not. Not all bees will suffer from stinging and then just die. All right, so our wasp is another group that belongs to Hymenoptera. So wasps do have social behavior. They can form colonies and nests, as I'm sure a few of you have seen before. Um, however, it's not quite as prevalent as it is in our usual bee species. So we're not going to see really, really well-developed caste systems in wasps. Uh, wasps can be both predators and herbivores. Um, I should add a caveat in here. I left this out, but there are bees that can also be predatory, like the vulture bee. Um, and I may have a picture in here later that I can show you of that. Wasps are, tend to be very, very territorial. So that's why when you run into a yellow jacket, it not only tries to sting you, all of its friends will come out and try to sting you. They will perceive anyone intruding on their territory as a threat. So it's very important to keep in mind. Another group that we have in Hymenoptera, we're all very familiar with, especially if you live in this area of Indiana, our, our ants. Our ants here are very, very active and they do really love to invade our homes. So ants are the extreme end of social behaviors when it comes to this group of insects. They have developed a very, very complex social environment with caste systems to the point that members of different castes have often have different organs than others do. Um, ants are adept at colonizing new areas. They form satellite hives, which is when we find that they invade our homes. And they are also able to adapt environments very, very easily um, not all of them are capable of stinging, though some, or I should rephrase that, ants aren't capable of stinging, though many members of different castes may have a defensive organ. For example, there is a bee species where the soldiers in it have what's referred to as a nasuti. This is an organ on their head that quite literally sprays acid as a defensive mechanism to protect their hive. So imagine seeing that. And then lastly, we have our sawflies. Now this is, we recognize many sawfly species as beneficial, particularly our braconid wasps, though they actually also do represent a pest too because sawflies are the insects that produce the rose slug. Now we rarely really notice sawflies when they're adults. Imagine seeing a very tiny little black wasp. Most of the time we just brush them off and move on with our day. Sawflies are not capable of stinging. They do have an ovipositor that you'll look at if you're lucky and you may see it and you'll think, oh, that's a stinging organ, but it actually won't really do anything to you. They're pretty harmless. Their larvae are gonna resemble caterpillars or slugs, which is why we refer to the rose slug. 
Um, it's actually a sawfly larva that's going to do that window painting damage on roses. And uh, well, yeah, I kind of finished everything there. Okay, this is a great picture of one of the members of that sawfly group. Uh, what's highlighted here by this picture is the number of pro legs it has. So those of you who like to keep up with your caterpillars, you'll know that your caterpillars have a limited number of pro legs. I think three is the actual number that's true across all caterpillars, no matter what species they are. However, if you look closely at this image of the sawfly larva, it has several sets of pro legs, far more than a Lepidoptera. So this is one way you can tell what species you're looking at is by counting the number of pro legs, those funny squishy leg-like appendages that they use to hold on to things. So now that we've gone over a few of these groups, let's talk a little bit about what they eat. Now, we should be fairly familiarized with this already, but it never hurts to double check. So we understand that bees consume combination of nectar and pollen from the flowers that they forage. The pollen is going to be their source of protein. The nectar is going to be the source of carbohydrates. So we need to keep in mind that foraging is a very, very energy expensive process, especially when you fly. Um, bees have evolved mouth parts specifically to be able to get these food sources. So if you take a close look at the mouth parts of a bee, you'll notice that they can not only use them to kind of lap up and drink up nectar in a kind of straw shape, but they can also move the different parts to be able to lap things into their mouth with tiny little arm-like appendages. Uh, there are is a small subset of bees that can feed on carrion and live prey. And this is when I was referring to the vulture bee pictured here. Um, this is not a bee that I think I have ever seen. I do believe this exists in other countries, not necessarily the United States. Um, I would love to see one one day because I think this is absolutely fascinating. But if you look underneath its head where its mouth parts are, you can actually kind of see it's got those really sharp looking pincers on it. So you can see that it's got mouth parts meant to handle something that's actually made of meat or something similar. Now here's a close up of the normal bee mouth parts, the bees that we know and love. Um, what, don't worry about memorizing these names or anything like that. You'll most likely never need to know them. But what you, the thing I want you to take home here is just the versatility of these mouth parts. So on the right side is when you see all those mouth parts locked together and closed. And they're going to use that to kind of suck up any nectar like a straw and lap it up. And then on the left hand side, this is when these mouth parts are now open. And you could see the things labeled as gallia. Those are the tiny arm-like appendages that they can use to scrape and grab things if they need to. So speaking of scraping and grabbing, one of the main sources of things they're going to do with this is get pollen. Pollen is going to be the major source of protein for these insects and many others. Pollen is going to provide a lot of water for the insect that they may not necessarily get out of nectar. It's also going to provide them a significant amount of their crude protein because they can't just survive off of nectar alone. So that's going to provide protein and some of the other structural components that their bodies will need. Amino acids are going to be present and that's going to vary by plant. So that's something to keep in mind a little bit if you want a good healthy set of bees. I imagine Tabby might have something to say about that. All right, so nectar, I want to cover this really quick. So nectar is going to be a primary source of carbohydrates. Remember, flight and foraging, especially during the spring and summer, are going to be very, very energy intensive. Um, it's very expensive to be able to keep muscles in motion, to keep wings going, and they'll deplete that very quickly, which is why nectar is going to be so critical to them. So the next thing to cover is how do bees find their food? You know, we can say, oh, bees do great foraging, they go so much so far, but how do they actually locate it? Well, one of the ways that they're going to do so is through their vision. Now, they have a host of chemical senses as well, but right now I'm going to focus on their vision. So insects in general have very poor vision because their bodies are composed of chitin. So that chitin makes up an exoskeleton on the outside of their body, this hardened armor. That includes their eyes. And you can imagine if you were looking at something that's essentially hardened kind of dim armor to look through, you're not going to see very much very easily. So insects can perceive movement. They're very sensitive to light and dark. And some of them do perceive color, though not the same colors we do. 
a lot of them who do see color perceive well into the ultraviolet range, and that includes our bees. Uh, bees do tend to have better eyesight than most other insects, so they have that going for them. And this first picture I showed you here, this gives you kind of an idea of what an insect is going to see looking through their eyes. Not much detail in there, it's just kind of blotchy colors and hard to make out shapes. But plants have evolved to account for this because many plants want pollinated. They need pollinators to be able to develop. So what they've done is they have adapted different colors into their petals, their leaves, etc. So if you look at the image on the left, you see pretty yellow flowers. But if you look at the image on the right, does that remind you of anything? Put in the chat what you think that looks like. Let's see if anybody can guess. Landing pad, yes, that is exactly right. These look like landing pads. The flowers are quite literally uh, signaling to all the other insects, please land here. This is where you want to go. I'm going backwards now. There we go. So another thing that happens is once bees are able to locate those landing pads and locate where they want to get their forage, they need to be able to communicate where it is to the rest of their hive. Now, our European honeybees have developed a particular adaptation to assist with this, known as the bee dance. And you're seeing an example of that movement right here. This is actually something entomologists have been able to translate. The bee dance is this really complex set of movements, but it does actually communicate specific information and it's actually translatable. So entomologists have figured out that the bee dance is able to communicate the direction, distance, and the quality of forage. And they can also signal when additional labor is needed when a foraging site has been identified. So that's, that's absolutely incredible. This is an insect whose brain is smaller than the head of a pin and they are able to communicate with each other in a language so clear that humans can understand it. So just think about that for a minute. That's absolutely amazing to me. So now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the bees that we love the most, our European honeybee. So the first thing we need to keep in mind about our European honeybee is they are not native. No matter what we wanna say or do, they will never be native. They are an introduced species and they are a major component of our food production and they are a livestock species. Now they've been here a very long time, so they've effectively adapted to our environment, but we are their caretakers, they're domesticated. Um, they have very well developed social structures, just like all other bees, and they have individual casts with workers, drones, and queens. And they are very efficient pollinators, particularly during warm days during the diurnal period. So that means during daylight, they're daytime foragers. What you're looking at right now is a picture of the different castes of bees. So the bottom one, C, that is our worker bee. This is the one that we are going to be most familiarized with. Now, I believe the image, the bee on image A is our male. That is our drone. You can even tell a little bit because it looks like his abdomen's curled down. So that, that is a meant for mating purposes. And then the queen is our one labeled B. You can see she's got that really extended abdomen. Her body's shaped a little bit differently. Um, they will mate on the wing when they form new hives. The drones really don't survive much past mating. That's all they're good for. And then the queens, of course, will be able to give birth to the workers that come and uh, assist with all the hive duties. There are going to be instances of wild hives. Uh, like I said, they have been here a while and we certainly find wild hives in different places. One of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that if you have a problem with a wild hive, uh, most areas of Indiana have a local beekeeping organization. So the counties I work in, Clay and Owen, both of them have very active beekeeping organizations and you can contact them to uh, have someone come out and help remove a wild hive if you have that as a problem. And I'm willing to bet that Tabby right now is putting in the chat the name of the Vigo County Beekeeping Association. Um, now, keep in mind, when you want to be a beekeeper, you need to double check the ordinances in your area to make sure that your city or your town allows it. A lot of towns will. Um, obviously, Terre Haute, where I live, does allow beekeeping, and I'm sure Tabby's going to talk more about that. Um, and then they may require removal or they may prohibit hives altogether, depending on their situations and the laws in that area. 
All right, and everybody note in the chat, she did put down, we do have Wabash Valley beekeepers and they meet at the White Violet Center. All right, so I'm gonna jump through our native bees here. So we do have a selection of native bees. And the reason I wanna go over these is because we often forget them, but they are just as important as our livestock species. Native bees are all pollinators. They're not gonna be, some of them won't be as efficient as, honey, as our European honeybees, some of them will. Um, many of them may be solitary, and many of them do have social behaviors that they develop. Uh, the great thing about native bees that I love is that while many of them can sting you, you've really got to work at it to make them sting you. They're not going to be as hair trigger as a lot of bees or wasps may be. So our first one on the docket is our mason bee. This one is a very, very common one. It is a solitary bee species that's going to become active essentially about a week ago. Uh, as long as the temperatures allow, and it's going to be active until June. These guys are really great because they love being in orchards, and they're going to help you pollinate your orchard, but they do have one problem. They will tend to cross-pollinate, so they will go from different species to different species. However, don't let that turn you off to the idea of them. They are great for pollinating during cooler periods, so they're going to be active, and they're going to be very, very helpful. Uh, another one of our native bees, this is one that I love because I just love the way they look, is our bumblebee. Uh, these are very common. I have them all through my yard. I actually let my yard grow a little bit more than um, other people do because I like the wildflowers that we've been kind of helping grow along in our yard. We have a lot of spring beauties and other things we're developing right now, and we'll see our bumblebees at them. So bumblebees, hopefully that didn't do anything. So bumblebees are highly social uh, insects that are going to form colonies with different cats. Um, now, only the queen will survive through the winter, so all the other members of the colony will survive, and then the queen will just redevelop it as the year goes on. Um, they are going to be very efficient pollinators, and they're capable of operating even during cool and cloudy days, and they're really, really harmless. Um, you could poke these guys practically, and they will not bother you. You, to get a bumblebee to sting you, you basically have to hold it in your hand and try crushing it, and then it will sting you. Otherwise, you can just let them go about their business and not worry. The only time that they will even get remotely aggressive is when they're defending their nest. This is the one I know that you all are going to hate, and I'm sorry, but carpenter bees are actually pollinators. They are a solitary species, but they are really well known for the economic damage they do depending on where you live. And I imagine a few of you have had to deal with the holes bored by carpenter bees into different wooden structures. Now, one good thing about them is they're incapable of stinging. They do not have the necessary organ to do so. However, they will try to act aggressive if you get near their nest. Now, keep in mind, they aren't really capable of much. They might try to do a test bite on you, but not much more than that. And they are beneficial pollinators. So they represent kind of a double-edged sword where they will damage wooden structures very easily, but they also do a lot of pollinating. Okay, so I just have a few questions I want all of you to consider, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Abby, or Tabby, sorry. Um, so how do we preserve our bees? How do we address this question? Because one of the things that I imagine a lot of you have heard of or a lot of you that are currently dealing with is losses of hives and we're also seeing losses of native bees. Now one of the things that's really pushing this is climate change unfortunately and this is something that we're going to have to deal with. Um, climate change impacts are going to have a lot of different effects. One of the biggest ones is going to be a loss of diversity in host plants. So as we warm up and I'm sure a lot of you are noting that this has already been occurring we will lose different plant species because the environment that they're adapted to isn't existing here now. Um, effectively, as time goes on, our hardiness zone is effectively moving. And that means plants are going to disappear and there are gonna be other effects as those species begin to shift around and more species become more prevalent and other ones disappear. The other thing that we're gonna to have to deal with climate change is that the synchronicity between plant blooming and bees coming out of their overwintering is going to become thrown off. That means plants will bloom at the wrong time and bees won't wake up at the right time to be able to pollinate them. Um, and this is going to incur costs to our bee populations. 
Uh, extended warm temperatures in the fall and winter are also going to contribute to colony loss. There are a variety of effects that could happen with that. Um, some colonies may not properly enter their diapause period where they enter, go through overwintering. Some of them may experience increased disease pressure as well. So while that is a little bit doom and gloom, there are a few things going on right now that will help with this. So one thing that's happening is research into domestic domestication of different species of bees to try to increase our availability of essentially livestock. Um, this will take a lot of time. Don't think that there's going to be some new bee species released tomorrow that you can take advantage of, but it is ongoing. We can work on planting flowers that are going to more accurately correspond with our environmental conditions. Bees are good at learning new plants, so they will figure out what's going to be available to them and they will take advantage of it. It's on us to make sure that we provide them food that they can take advantage of. And we at our programs, we talk all the time about how to plant for pollinators. And I believe in a few weeks, I'm going to be doing a pollinator planting course anyway. So just pay attention for that. And of course, none of us here like the idea of pesticides coming into contact with our bees. So what I want to encourage all of you to do is learn as much as you can about pesticides. Understand when they're used and understand when not to use them. And that will help others learn from you how we can better use our pesticides to protect our bees. All right, so I've got one more slide, but I'm gonna share that at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tabby. All right, guys, can everybody see me? So I am not gonna share my screen. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a live demonstration for you guys today. So like Bob said, I am a beekeeper and I have five hives here at the house. There, I don't know if you can see, there are two back behind here and I've got this brand new hive that I won. There was a beekeeping 101 class that I helped with for our clay and Vigo County beekeepers and I won it in a raffle. So I have a brand new hive and I'm gonna be putting bees into it. But I'm, first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about beekeeping and why I enjoy it and why lots of people enjoy it and some of the basics for someone who might be interested in getting into beekeeping. So um, the, the hives that I have here, they all look like this one right here. This is called a Langstroth hive. Um, it is, they come in eight or 10 frame hives and the frames have a variety of different shapes. Um, so, or not shapes, but types. So this is one that a lot of people use um, and it has a foundation built into it already. So if you can see this really close, it looks like beehive structure already. This is actually a plastic panel and it's coated in beeswax. So the bees have kind of a basic structure to go off of. They have a little bit of a head start because they've got this whole thing filled out. And so they just start building their comb on top of that. There are other types you can get that have um, no foundation in them. This is one of my other, from one of my other older hives. And you can see, I can stick my fingers through here uh, where it's not connected. This is a free form frame. So um, if you were to look at it before it had anything and you'll see some here in a little bit when I open up this one, um, it doesn't have any structure inside the wooden frame. It's just open and the bees get to build how they want. And you kind of have to watch them because when they get the opportunity to build how they want, they will build crazy structures and sometimes you have to clean them out and get them forming their their honeycomb in the correct direction. So there are lots of other parts to my hive and if you can see the bottom here, um, this bar that runs across the bottom, this is an entrance limiter. So it slides back and forth and I can essentially uh, change how much space is open for the bees to come out. So when I put new bees in, I like to leave it closed like this. So there's not a ton of space. They've just got these little holes they can come out. And that kind of makes them feel a little more secure. They're in a new area. They're not familiar. They're really testy when you get them into a new hive because they have a brand new thing to defend and they're not used to the area. Um, once it gets warmer in the summer, I will open it wide open. And this is gonna do two things. It's gonna allow for lots of bees to be flying in and out and, um, bringing in honey and, or bringing in nectar and pollen and things like that. And it's also gonna help with airflow. So many people don't realize that bees need a decent amount of airflow in the hive to keep it at a certain temperature. So they will keep it around 90 degrees constant. And that is also in the winter time. 
So in the summer when it gets really hot, we open it wide open. Um, you can lift this top uh, lid up a little bit and give them some more ventilation. There's a screen in the bottom that you can remove that'll also give them added ventilation. So uh, when they do get really hot in the summer, you'll see them hanging off the front and that's called bearding. And those bees out there are beating their wings to encourage airflow into the hive to kind of cool things off. So it's really cool to see, but I also feel bad for the bees because I know that they're really hot and there's not anything I can do for them. So then in the fall, I'll start closing it down again. Um, we'll push it back shut in the fall this way. And then in the winter, I'll actually pull it out and flip it around so that I can really limit the amount of air going in. And that's gonna help keep them warm. And it's also gonna help keep humidity out in the winter because that can be very detrimental to them. So there are other things that beekeepers use. I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with these. These are smokers. Um, they're used to calm the bees down. There are lots of theories on why it calms them down. There are a couple that are pretty good, pretty solid. Um, one of them is that the bees think their hive is on fire. And so they fill their stomachs with honey in an effort to evacuate and move somewhere else. It's partially true. The other reason they work really well is because they can cover up the alarm pheromone that bees release when the hive is open. So every hive will have a handful of guard bees and they will guard the entrances. And as soon as you get the hive opened up, they start releasing this pheromone that we have an intruder, everybody be on high alert. And when they do that, the whole hive will get very agitated. So hitting them with the fogger uh, kind of dissipates that pheromone and prevents them from alarming the whole hive that something's going on. You can also use it if you're a beekeeper and you get stung. If you, like if I got stung in my hand and I puffed smoke onto my hand, that would uh, dissipate the pheromone of attack. So now the other bees don't know that I've been stung and they're not also gonna come after me, which is a good thing for me. Um, so when we light these, uh, lots, lots of people have different preferences for what they use. I have a lot of pine trees around, so I use a lot of pine needles. Um, I also use uh, dried leaves or wood chips. You can buy pre-made pellets or um, like wood chips that you would use in a wood smoker. It's just up to your individual preference and what you want to use. I'm actually not going to use this today when I put the bees in the hive. New bees are already uncomfortable. They're in a new situation, but they're also, they don't have anything to guard. So they're not in the hive yet. They're in a box, they're disoriented. So not until they get into the hive will they realize they have something to guard. So they should be relatively calm. I might still get stung, but I'm gonna hold off on using this for today. So uh, another tool we have, this is every beekeeper's best friend. It's called a hive tool. Um, this end is very sharp and we can use it to pry things apart. Bees produce this substance called propolis and they use it to close any tiny opening that they find in the hive. They will also use it to seal shut every box that I stack on top of this box and they will stick all of their frames together. So it's really hard to pull them out and you use this tool to cut loose that stuff, scrape it off if it's somewhere it's not supposed to be. There's also a prying end so I can use it to pry frames out if they're stuck in there really good. So this is every beekeeper's best friend. You can see mine is very dirty. I use it all the time. It works really well. Uh, another tool we have that you're gonna get to see me use today. This is a bee brush and it's very soft bristle and you use it, so if I had, pulled this frame out to look at it and there were bees on it. I could use this brush and gently brush them out of the way so I could see what's going on with their comb structure, if they're laying eggs properly and things like that. So it's just a really gentle way to move the bees around if they are in your way and you can't get to what you're trying to do. Now we also have a frame grabber, which is kind of like a fancy pair of uh, grippers. And this is essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. You use it to pull frames up out of the hive. So it helps you kind of get around getting your fingers in between them to pull them out. And in addition to that, we have a frame stand. So this actually goes on the side of the hive and I can show you. So we put it on the side of the hive like this. And then if I were to pull a frame out, pull it out and set it in there so that I can look at the rest of the hive and even look at this frame as it's sitting out. Uh, this is, so this is what the empty one looks like. This is, these bees are gonna get to build their brand new comb. So I'm a little nervous about what they're gonna do. Hopefully they build it correctly. Uh, when you look at these empty frames, 
and they have kind of a ridge underneath the top bar and that is supposed to help guide the bees to build honeycomb straight down they don't always do that sometimes they will build across and then you have to go and break it out but hopefully they're going to do the right thing here and i won't have to do too much comb breaking so you saw me pull some things off the hive before i got in there this is called the inner cover and you can see it's got some ventilation holes here so when i mentioned i can lift off that upper lid i can prop it up it's called a telescoping lid and that'll allow more ventilation to flow through these holes it also has a small you can see this right here opening this is the top entrance to the hive so this always stays open we like to give them the option to come out of the top usually there are guard bees sitting right there waiting for you when you try and open the hive which is always a little unnerving but uh, they use this the same way they use the bottom one a little bit less so but it does allow for that little bit of airflow to go from the bottom of the hive and up out the top so if it were sitting on the hive you can see they've just got this little opening on the top so air can go in and come out the top now we also have the outer cover whoops these ones are a lot more durable um, they're thicker and they're pretty sturdy the outside is metal coated so it can get rained on um, it can get wet it can get snowed on and it's not going to let any liquid seep into the hive we also paint our hives and that is kind of a personal preference to some extent of the beekeepers so most of the time you'll see white hives that's the traditional color and that has two reasons one is because white paint is very cheap so we can paint a lot of hives very quickly and not have to pay too much money the other reason is that we want to keep our hives cool so we don't want to add any additional heat to them if we're concerned about them being cold in the winter we can always wrap something around the hive and put some hay bales or something up but during the summer months we want it to stay cool so most hives like this one are white i do have yellow and pale green as well but for the most part we keep them very light colored so some additional tools uh, beekeepers always have a long sleeve shirt on so i've got my long sleeve shirt on this is going to prevent bees from getting in my arms if they're aggressive um, it's going to stop them from getting in my neck if i were wearing a t-shirt they could maybe get down into my t-shirt and that'd be a bad time um, i also have long pants on and you'll see that when i stand up here in a little bit to get working on the bees and my long shirt is buttoned all the way up and tucked into my pants so this is going to prevent bees from going up underneath my shirt in addition to that, I have on boots and socks. So we don't want bees flying up the pant leg and getting at your ankles. So the next thing we have is a hat or veil. There are lots of different styles. My preferred one is just a hat with the veil around the top of it. So this keeps bees out of my hair. Even if the bees weren't aggressive, they will get stuck in your hair. So even if I have a very non-aggressive hive, I always have a veil on just to keep them from getting tangled in my hair or maybe going down the back of my shirt. There are other options if you don't if you don't feel comfortable with just this around your face and you want a little more protection, you can get a whole bee suit. And that's one continuous piece that um, is like a big jumpsuit that zips up and it's got the veil on it. They are pretty warm. So that's one of the main reasons I don't prefer them. Um, they're very bulky, very warm. And if you have a lot of hives to go through, you can get really hot really quickly. So I'll go ahead and put this one on. So when I put it on, I make sure that I put my arms through my little straps here. And I make sure that my collar is tucked up underneath the veil so that nobody's getting in there. Now, the next thing I have are gloves and my gloves are very long. Uh, they are ankle length or elbow length, sorry. So this is gonna keep bees from getting my hands. A lot of times I will work in the hive without gloves on. But uh, when I'm putting new bees in, or if I'm not sure how the hive's gonna react, I will wear my gloves because I don't wanna get stung. They are leather in the hand part, and then the, the collar of it is a thick linen so that you can't really get stung through it. And this also helps from getting stung in the elbow. A lot of times when I do get stung, it's if I don't have gloves on and I get a bee right in my elbow and then I bend my arm and they get panicked and then I get stung. So I put on my long gloves. And I'm gonna back you guys up just a little bit so you can see a little better. All right, so I've got my hive 
And I have my box of bees. So what a little known fact, you can get bees shipped in the mail. So these bees came from Georgia. They're actually Russian bees. And that doesn't mean they're a different type of honeybee. It means they're a different strain. So we have lots of strains of honeybees that come from different areas of the world. They're all European honeybees, but depending on where they come from, they get their name. So these are Russian bees. They come from the Russian area. Uh, the reason I picked them was because they're very cold tolerant. And I've had issues in the past with bees not making it through the winter. Uh, because we do get some pretty frigid wind where very open um, out in the country so we get a lot of wind so hopefully these bees will do a little bit better in the winter and they're also a little more aggressive towards varroa mites so i'm hoping to see a little bit of cross between these bees and my other bees and maybe some strength in my colonies when it comes to defending them from mites and also hive beetles uh, i have another package of bees coming that are saskatchewan bees they are coming from wisconsin and they are a canadian strain of european honeybee uh, most people keep Italian honeybees or Carolyn honeybees, and both of those come from Europe. They both come from the same general area. So Italian bees obviously come from Italy, and the Carolyn ones come from an island that's off the coast of France. Both of those types of bees are really calm and docile. They are not very aggressive when you open up the hive, which a lot of people like, especially if you're first getting started in keeping bees. It's nice to have a calm beehive. But there's a little bit of a downside. They do tend to swarm. And what that means is that if they think they're getting too crowded in the hive, half of the bees and the queen will leave and the other half will stay and make a new queen. So you lose your production throughout the year because your bees are picking up and moving out when they think they're getting too crowded. So these guys don't swarm very often. So I'm hoping they stick around and they do some good things. Uh, the other option is to get wild swarms. And I do have some wild swarms. Um, they are honeybees that have been naturalized to the area. So they're very familiar with Indiana temperatures and climate. They know that in the winter, it can fluctuate a great deal. It can get super cold and then get really warm and they're used to it. So those ideally are the best bees, but you can't always come by them very easily. So when I open this up, there's a lot of bees are gonna come out and it can be a little alarming, but I promise you it's all right. Um, what I'm gonna do is pry off this top board up here and underneath that, there is a canister of simple syrup that the bees were shipped with. It has some holes in the bottom so that they've had something to feed on in the mail. Um, when they come through the mail, they will get held up at the post office, your local post office, and they'll call you and tell you that your bees are here. And usually they want you to pick them up that day because no one likes seeing bees coming through the mail for some reason. So um, I'll pry this off. There's a canister of simple syrup that I'll pull out. And then in there also is a really small box. It's about this long and it's got the queen in it. So the queen gets shipped in her own special little box and that is to prevent you from losing the queen. So if I were to open this and start dumping bees into the old hive or the new hive, I might dump her and not get her in the hive or something might happen, she might get injured. So they ship her in her own little box. She is getting fed. The other workers are feeding her through the stream that's on her box. So she's plenty well fed, uh, but she is in her own little container. And I will put her in the hive and not release her from her container for a couple days. And this is going to allow the bees to um, get used to being in that area, recognize that their queen is in that area, and she will hopefully recognize it as well so that when I do release her, um, she's ready to stay and she'll start her job producing eggs and starting a new colony. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. I'll set it up here. So I will need my hive tool and my brush. I'm gonna pull a couple of my frames out so that I have some space to dump bees in.
harvester's not coming out. I'm going to have to cut the side of the mesh now that I've got the bees all wound up. So now that I've got it cut open, you can see I've got some bees flying out. I can pop the canister out here. So you can see they've got this very large canister. They're getting plenty of food to come with them on the trip. And I'm going to set that down right in front of the hive in case there's anybody still feeding on it. So now what I'm going to do is pull out the queen box. Well, she's stuck in there. So what I'm going to do is dump some bees. The goal is to get as many into the box as I can. Obviously, there's a lot that are not in the box. Uh, what's really cool here, if you guys can see this, is they started building honeycomb in their little um, container here around the queen cell. So that's why I couldn't get her out. So here is my little queen in her little box. And she does have some workers with her. So she's being very well taken care of. She's got food, she's got company. And I'm just gonna take this and put it in the hive, stuck next to one of these frames, kind of between it. So now they know she's in here, she's not going anywhere. We'll see if we can get some more of these bees dumped out. They're pretty content in the box. And the ones that don't come out, I'm just gonna set the box down in front of it and that's gonna let them find their way out. So get this out here. When bees build honeycomb, a lot of it has to do with what color the food is that they're eating. So these guys have been eating sugar water. The comb is very white, um, which I think is always super cool to see. It's really cool to show people that based on what they're eating, their comb can be a different color. So now that we've got all these guys in here, I'm gonna put the rest of my frames in. And I'm gonna need my bee brush. We got a lot of bees on top. We're gonna need to get in there. And then I'm gonna take my outer frame and I'm gonna slide it from the back very gently. I don't wanna crush anybody. I wanna give them a chance to get in there. All right, so now they got their new hive. They're gonna figure things out here. I will put the outer cover back on. I've got the entrance pretty well open so they can find their way in. And that is essentially how you put new bees in the hive. So I've got a lot of bees on me. I'm gonna try and squat back down without getting stung. So that is all I have for you guys today. Does anybody have any questions? You can also enter questions in the chat if you want yeah. to, or at this point, you can go ahead and unmute and ask them if you'd like. And I don't know if you guys can hear, the bees are very loud. They are just barely coming through. I didn't notice it until you said something. I am, I am very happy that I'm over here, Tabby. It's so it looks very chaotic. And the, the very first time I had to put bees in a hive, I was terrified because you could like there are thousands of bees in the air right now. It's a little alarming, but you have to realize they don't know where they are and they're very confused. So they're not out to sting unless I accidentally pinch them or something like that. Um, I was a little concerned because I've never had Russian bees before and I know that they're very aggressive, but so far, no one seems to care that I'm still sitting right in front of the hive. They're finding their way in. 
So we do have one question. Someone is asking, what does the typical care schedule look like for you five? So my typical care schedule, um, it varies beekeeper to beekeeper. If I have a hive that I've got problems with, I'll be in there two or three times a month. Um, if there are no issues, then I'm in there about once a month. Um, I check them pretty, you know, while I'm outside. You can tell a lot by walking past. You can smell and see a lot of things and recognize when something's going on in the hive that you need to take care of. Do we have any other questions for Tabby? Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything. So I'm gonna say thank you, Tabby, very much for that demonstration. That was You're absolutely welcome. fascinating, especially to me who's never been a beekeeper <laughs> myself. And for anybody who wants to be a beekeeper and is thinking about it, if you contact either of those beekeeping organizations, um, they are more than happy to let you come out and be free labor and teach you everything you need to know about beekeeping so that you can get your own hive going. I saw what does a shipment of bees cost? It varies depending on where they're coming from and what kind they are. Um, this shipment of bees cost me about $150 and that included tax. So when they ship them, you get one queen and you get about 3000 bees. So that's three pounds of bees. A really happy, healthy hive will be somewhere for between 10 and 15,000 bees. So they've got a ways to go before they're full. Will I be feeding them? So yes, I do have um, on the top hives, hive feeders. Um, I don't have one set up for this hive. It's a little bit of a different shape than my other ones. So I will be getting um, a screw top feeder that I can stick on the front of the hive for them. How do I get them off before I take my stuff off? So they, for the most part, are off of me. Um, I moved away from the hive, so they're figuring things out. If I'm harvesting honey, I'll usually have a lot of bees on me. And in that case, I will just take that bee brush and kind of brush them and walk away. And if I still see some on me, I'll brush them again and walk a little bit further away. But for the most part, they, they figure it out. Tabby, I will warn you, you have a few stragglers on your hat still. Oh yeah, usually that happens, especially with new bees. Mm -hmm. So what, what goes in the feeder? It's a mixture of sugar and water. It's a simple syrup. And depending on what time of year it is, that syrup is different. So right now it's springtime, which means nectar is flowing. So the syrup is about a one-to-one -one ratio. So it's a little thin, runs really well. They can access that sugar pretty quickly. In the winter, you feed them more of a two-to-one or three-to-one, or even just a pack of sugar. So you can wet down some sugar and stick that in there in like a big sheet. Did I put some beeswax on the bottom of the top bar? I did not. Um, lots of people do, but I found that for the most part, they can figure out what they're supposed to do without putting the wax on there. Oh, did I'm you like, see someone ask, do you continue to use the food ship with them or did you answer that one already? Uh, I don't. By the time they get here, it's, it's about halfway through and I don't really have a way to set that feeder up. I will leave it sitting on its side while they're getting acclimated to their new location. But tonight, once they're all in the hive, I'll go take it out. Um, how do I keep predators, dogs, kids, others away from the hive? So I will go out uh, and put a brick on top of that hive that'll keep things like skunks and raccoons out. Uh, for the most part, dogs don't mess with them. Kids are afraid of them. So, <laughs> so I don't have to deal with kids coming too close, but they don't really mind a lot of things. Uh, we have, we can push the mower right up to the front of the hive and no issues. So not unless you're really pestering them or it's been raining and they're having a bad day. They're not too worried about anybody coming up there. 